Well, we've seen a lot so far, I guess, in terms of looking at the return of Christ. Although this is entitled the millennium, it's a bit deficient in my studies in that I haven't gone, you know, looking at life all the way through the millennium. I've still marooned myself just in the initial stages of the Lord's return and setting up the kingdom. And we want to look at, just this morning, for Sunday school in an interactive way, a, uh, the little, a more of an exhortational point, I guess. We looked at Revelation 10 yesterday and the March of the Rainbow Angel and some of the, uh, some of the activities and the uh, deployments and the strategies that we may be you know, employed in to overthrow this world and to subdue it. What we want to know today and have a look at is how we're going to be part of that, like the rainbow angel. And we're going to look at John taking the book and the scroll and eating it. And in his mouth it was sweet as honey and in his belly it was, uh, it was bitter. And who, who would do that? If I said to you, here, come and eat this, you'll love it. It's so sweet. It's like candy. Do you, do you call it lollies or candy over here? Candy. Yeah, candy. It's candy. This is beautiful. And you go, oh, Excellent. But I just a warning, it's going to give you the worst bellyache ever. It's, you know, it's terrible. Probably vomit and bring it all up afterwards. You'll never forget it. Do you still want it? I wouldn't eat it. Put it that way. So to start off with, I want to give you two pictures. So pictures of the kingdom. And obviously, these are made up in mind. I don't know exactly how bad it's going to be, but it says a time of trouble such as never was. So... If it's a time of trouble such as never was, I don't think we'll be shaking our iPhones going, oh, this is terrible. My iPhone's, my iPhone's not working. You know, I don't think we're going to be doing that. I think it's going to be really bad. Even worse than that. So, computers. You imagine the shattered communities. Like, whole families broken. No infrastructure after the earthquakes. In certain areas of the world, and probably most areas of the world, no lights, sewerage, people have nothing. And one by one, maybe two from a family, perhaps one, in, in some cases maybe whole families, maybe, maybe sincere religious people, God will spare them, who knows, but they start to regroup. And they're all looking for answers and they know that when they sit around their little fires at night, asking themselves questions. They know that they've believed lies that their fathers told them, that this society which they once trusted in has given them nothing. It's a been a big, big lie. And it's provided them absolutely nothing. There's no stability. And they're going to want answers, aren't they? And there may be some people sitting around there in those communities which know you. Think about that. They'll be there talking and saying, well, what are the answers? What are we going to do with ourselves? How, how are we going to move into the future? And somebody says, you know what? I used to work with this guy. I used to work with this girl. I didn't want to listen to them at the time. But you know what? Everything that's happened is exactly the way they said it was going to happen. All the wars in the Middle East, Russia coming down. He, he, they even told me when they were in Syria. They, they were excited about that at the time. I used to think, oh, stupid Putin, but he's not going to do anything because Trump will look after him. Nothing, everything they said has come to pass exactly. The, the destruction of the Vatican and all those wars. I know they're out there somewhere. They told me all about the kingdom. Christ is in the earth. I know it's true because everything they've said, it's exactly right. They're out there somewhere you know what, I want to be part of this kingdom. You know, well, people will be sitting there talking like this if we've told them. And in we will walk into those communities, perhaps at the time of the Mid-Heaven Proclamation, when we go forward to the earth and say, listen, there is a hope. Fear God and give glory to him. Keep his commandments. And at that time, people will be hanging off every word we have to say. They didn't want to listen when we were here working with them, rubbing shoulders you know, sitting with them in the lunchroom, so if they'd laugh and say, oh, well, you know, that's your belief. I've got my own belief. Or will they say to you, now this is what scares me the most, how many people I've brushed past and had to do with in my life and I've never mentioned the truth to? If they said to me, you, you're one of them, 
How come you never told me about it? That actually horrifies me to think about that. And yet, there's probably thousands in my life who know me and I've passed. Maybe, but I've never said anything to. And it doesn't give me much comfort if I think to myself, well, at least I was a good person. At least they probably knew I was religious. But sometimes I think that's okay. And then we're going to walk. Just have a look at this. This is really beautiful. Have a look at Revelation chapter 19. We're in our beautiful white garments. And it says this in Revelation 19, that to the bride, in verse um, 7, the bride has made herself ready. And in verse 8, it was granted her to be clothed in fine linen, clean and white. Mine says bright and pure, but the AV I think it says clean and white. Fine and clean and white. Why? Well, it says there the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And for all those righteousnesses that we've tried to do and attempted to be like all of our life, God now in this metaphor has said you can be clothed in that fine linen. It's become you. You wanted immortality, you tried to act out immortality all your life, and now you get to have it. And that's what the Bible depicts us as being clothed in. And people are going to look at us and then look at themselves in their ragged clothes, dirty clothes. It's going to go back to primitive times having to wash their clothes in the river. They're not even going to wash them. They're going to look at us and think, how do I get a set of clothes like that? Because it's not going to be about the clothes, it's going to be about the people we are, the immortal people that we are. I want to be like them and everything that we wear in that day will speak of our immortality and everything they've got on will speak of everything they don't have, immortality. When you get to Revelation 22, this idea of the origin of our clothing and the brightness and the whiteness is just simply amazing because it says in chapter 22 we have this this beautiful wood where this river flows out of it. It reminds us of the Garden of Eden. And it says there that the water of life, it says, he showed me a river, a pure river of the water of life, clear as crystal. You wouldn't believe it, but they're exactly the same two words as Revelation 19 verse 8, where she was arrayed in white linen, clean and uh, white. Exactly the same two words. And here it's related to the water. Can anybody tell me how? Why would our garments be related in some way to water? Does anybody see any correlation? Perhaps? And do you know that, that quote, is it you, Jonathan, that said that? That quote is absolutely amazing because that quote in Ephesians 5 talks about the Lord Jesus Christ washing the bride. That's what Revelation 19 said. The bride has made herself ready and God gave her those clean white garments. It's through the washing of the water by the word. Christ said, ye are clean, same word. Ye are clean through the word which I've spoken unto you. There's other quotes too, but we get the idea. You get the idea of it being related to a river too because all nations in Isaiah 2 shall come up to Jerusalem. And what will come out of Jerusalem? That's right. The water or the word will go forth from that place. And so what people are going to see, finally, because we've been banging on about this Bible all our lives, and people have been like, that, the good book. That's what my dad used to call it, the good book. Sarcastically, they're going to see the vital link between this and what we have now become in the kingdom. How brilliant is that? That's just the most incredible thing. They're going to say, hold on, I want to be like you. And we'll say, well, you've got to listen to this. And they'll go, that's the link? The pure white garments and the immortal body is linked to that? Absolutely. Do we see the link now? Do we understand every time we read this book, it gets us closer and closer to immortality and gets us closer and closer to cleanness? We've got to understand it now. If we want to walk in in that day into those tattered, scattered, absolutely devastated communities and give them a hope, we've got to believe it now and hang off every word that this, this book has to say now. That's, to me, that is so important. And don't worry, as I'm saying it, I'm listening to myself and thinking, yeah, you should take note of that. It's an exhortation. 
Second point, think about this for another picture. We're in the kingdom again. And this time we put our hands up because we want to go and destroy Babylon. And we happen to be with all the protesters. You know, a lot of um, brethren from the medi- medieval sort of Middle Ages and sisters are there too who had died at the hands of the Catholics and in between throwing down hailstones and lightning and earthquakes and we're having a great time, don't get me wrong, because Babylon's going down and it deserves it. We stop and we strike up a conversation with one of these people and we say, well, you come from the Middle Ages. Like, what was your story? What happened to you? And they said, oh, it was terrible, you know, because I was so ashamed of myself. What happened was I was preaching, you know, in um, Moldova or something in, in Europe there and I was captured. I was told not to preach and they captured me and they put me on the rack. It was distressing as anything but I'm, I, just, I, I can't even hardly tell you. I was so ashamed. I denied Christ and I went away a broken man. My wounds took 12 months to heal but I, I recanted and I said I didn't know the Lord. And you're listening to this, and well, what happened then? And they said that, well, we came back after that, and we got another campaign. So many people came to the truth. It was incredible. God really blessed our efforts. But I was captured once more, my wife and I, and, but this time I didn't recant. They, they brought me up to the, to the rostrum, and I had to read the letter of recantation, recantation out, and I refused to do it, and I began to preach. And they marched me off prison and they put me to death. It was horrible but I died for Christ faithfully and he turned to his wife and what, what happened to you? Well they offered that I could go and live in a noble's house if I gave up our religion the heresy they called it and stuck to being a Catholic but I said I'd rather remain faithful to my Lord and my husband and they drowned me in the river. You know it's a true story don't you? And they said but we don't, no don't, we don't, we don't talk about us We want to hear about you. You lived in the last days. What was it like in the last days? Must have been incredible. How many preaching efforts were you involved in? How many people came to the truth? The Ecclesiastes must have been unified. How exciting was it? Did you have bars on your houses to keep the Catholics out? You know? No, I had bars on my windows to keep robbers out because I had so much stuff. Can Can you imagine having that conversation? Like, it's humiliating. I don't even want to... I don't even want to talk to them for about a thousand years till I get used to it. But brothers and sisters, like seriously, these are some of the people we're going to meet in the kingdom. Now, do we want to be part of that? Of course we do. Revelation chapter 10, have a look at this. This is the rainbow angel that we discussed yesterday. And John, as we said, our representative in this chapter, he represents all the saints who are going to be part of this. This rainbow angel who go out and prophesy again to the nations. The angel says, you, you, you can't have the little scroll open, but I'll tell you what, here, eat it. The angel standing on the sea with his hand raised says to John, where is this verse here? In verse... In verse 8, he says to him, go and take the scroll... That's open in the hand of the angel who's standing on the sea and on the land. So he goes to the angel, takes the scroll, and John's probably really excited. What's he going to do with this scroll? What's he going to let me do with it? Eat it. Take it and eat it. And it'll make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it'll be sweet as honey. Now, all prophets do this, you understand? This is why Revelation 19 portrays people who speak the word as having the sword out of their mouth because they take God's word in, they consume it and when they speak the words it's like a prophet just by uttering God's warning fights against the people who aren't listening because as soon as they utter those words the people hear it and don't do it God's judgments will come so they fight against them with the words of their mouth just by speaking them and so John eats it because he's got to prophesy again it says there in verse 11 before many peoples, nations and languages and kings. This is what you and I are going to do. John's doing this on our behalf, but I've got to ask you the question, who would eat it? Who would take that, word, that scroll and eat it? I mean, what are the chances of living? Has anybody ever else done this before? Where the angel said to him, you don't be rebellious, you open your mouth and eat this. And the prophet took it and ate it. Where was that? 
Anybody know? Because eating a scroll obviously means reading its contents, doesn't it? There's, this is an image. It doesn't, it's not really what we have to do. We don't literally eat a book, but you eat and consume a book simply by reading it. I mean, it's a normal... Yes? Well done. Do you remember what chapter? Would you say chapter 2? That's a good work. I, I, I'm happy with chapter 2. So chapter 2 of Ezekiel. Ezekiel goes through this. And what we find is, by eating the word of God, we end up feeling the same way he does about things. Because I want to know what the sweetness and the bitterness is. And Ezekiel's told, you've got to go and prophesy to the house of Israel. And by the way, they're rebels. You can circle in chapter 2 how many times he says, stubborn, rebellious rebels, transgressors. All the way through that section. I don't even, and God says, I don't care if they want to hear or they don't. I don't care if they listen or they don't. You're going to go and talk to them. That's what he says to them. And then he says, open your mouth and eat what I give you in chapter 2 and verse 8. Look, behold, there's a hand stretched out. The book was in it. Writing, full of judgments, lamentation, woe and mourning, written on the front and back. It was absolutely chock-a-block full of God's judgments for a rebellious people. So Ezekiel eats it, and it was sweet as honey, it says in chapter 3 there in his mouth. Absolutely beautiful. Can anybody find the bitterness that he felt? Because he goes out and he has to talk to this rebellious house. Where's the bitterness? This is worth, this is worth discussing too in terms of revelation because he's told to eat this at the time of a great earthquake. It's really interesting, which is what revelation is all about, the, that rainbow angel at the time of a great earthquake. It's verse 14, look. The spirit lifted me up and took me away, and I went in bitterness, in the heat of my spirit. Now, the idea there is the heat of his spirit means hot, indignant anger. So how is bitterness related to anger? What's the sweetness and what's the bitterness? Does anybody know what is making Ezekiel angry? Does anybody know? Because John feels the same. You may have heard people say before, oh, we take in the sweetness of God's word and when we go to put it into practice, it's really it's hard, it's, it's bitter. It's, that's not what it's talking about. You take in God's word, it is sweet, you love it, you learn to love righteousness. But what do you get angry at? What, do you, what fires you up with indignation? What do you guys think? Rebels, sin, transgression, anything against God. That's what becomes bitter. And without the sweetness of the word, you'd never feel it. In fact, if you want to feel better about sin and your life, just close your Bible and walk away. You'll start feeling fine in no time at all. But the more you hang out with your brothers and sisters and you talk about these things, the more you realise how much you hate the world. That's what it is. He was angry at the rebellious house of Israel. And John, when he took it in, because he had to go and prophesy amongst the other nations, it was the ten kingdoms of Europe, foremostly, that John was talking about. You have to prophesy to them. John knew that those kingdoms were the ones who had devastated the truth and it made him angry. And he, was felt, he felt that bitterness as well. It's the bitterness against sin. We always remember. We know, we know that. I mean, can anybody think of any other passages of the Bible where there's bitterness? That's absolutely, actually, that's, let's go there. That's uh, Isaiah 7. I think it's Isaiah 7 because we're going to go there. And look, I don't mind jumping ahead. Let's go to that chapter because this really, this brings it out. This is absolutely true. This is the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to know how we're going to be part of it. We're going to take in the word of God. So was Christ any different? No way. It says in verse 15, this is Emmanuel. That he should know, he eats the curds and the honey, that he might know how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the boy knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land whose two kings you dread shall be deserted. So there it is. But can you think of other passages where bitterness is used? Just think about it. 
We leave Egypt, what happens? Oh, yeah, Mara is an excellent one. They get to the water. Oh, finally we found some water. Ah, oh, it's bitter. So what do they do to sweeten it? They throw the wood in. And that's Christ. Our lives are bitter without the Lord Jesus Christ in it. Any other bitterness before we leave Egypt? I mean, your last meal, right? And mum makes you eat something that goes, ah, that's disgusting. Why would you do that for, mum? Why did she do it? Because I want you to remember that. When we lived in Egypt, it was horrible. We're going to go out in the wilderness for 40 years and you know what you're going to... Not that I knew at the time, I'm just being dramatic. When you go out there, you're going to, all you're going to think of is the leeks and the guards. But I want you to remember, it's horrible here. Serving Pharaoh and sin is disgusting. That's why they had the bitter herbs in their meal. Because when we think about you know, the world, we think, oh, it's so good out there. It's wonderful. And we forget how bitter it is. Absolutely. So is, is this right? Well, it is. Look at uh, Psalm 100 and 119. Look at this. Psalm 119. We all feel this through the word of God. And verse 104. 103 for context. How sweet are your words to my taste. Sweeter than honey to my mouth. What does that mean? I mean, that's a, such a beautiful image. Sweet are your words to my taste. How they're sweeter than honey to my mouth. What does it mean? Well, verse 104. Through your precepts I get understanding. There's the sweetness. And here comes the bitterness. Therefore, I hate every false way. When you eat it, it's going to be beautiful. It'll be so sweet. You'll get understanding. But it's going to make your belly bitter. You'll feel it down in here. You'll hate every false way. That's what John experienced. That's what Ezekiel experienced. That's what we all experience in our life. Jeremiah experienced the same thing. You know what it says of Jeremiah? Well, should, we should go there. We've probably got enough time. Jeremiah 15. We'll just turn up a, a fair few quotes, brothers and sisters, just to make up for that class yesterday, which I didn't turn up any quotes in. Jeremiah 15, verse 16 says... Your words were found and I ate them. Your words became to me a joy. How about that for sweet as honey? It was a joy and a delight to my heart. I just loved it. For I'm called by your name, O Yahweh, God of hosts. But look at verse 17. This is what happened immediately after he ate the word. I did not sit in the company of revelers, nor did I rejoice. I sat alone because your hand was upon me. You filled me with indignation. It means to froth at the mouth in anger. That's incredible. It's exactly the same experience of every single person in the Bible. There's a really beautiful um, a correlation of these ideas too. If I asked you, like, if I said to you, like, sin always brings bitterness, doesn't it? In our life, suffering, shame, sorrow, it's bitter. When we feed on sin, it always produces bitterness. What's the most bitter thing that sin can produce? Death. It's death. And you know, you know that, that chapter where Saul, as he always does, never ever listened to the word. Remember that chapter when Agag came out and God had said, Oh, Saul, Samuel had told him, go and kill all the Amalekites, everybody, women, children, the whole works, the animals as well. And Saul goes, yeah, got that. He goes out there, what does he do? Saves Agag alive, saves a few oxen alive, a few sheep. Samuel comes in and goes, what's this? What's this I can hear? Lowing the oxen, the bleeding the sheep? Didn't you listen? I remember Agag tiptoes out, what does he say? Surely bitterness of death is past. Samuel says, I don't think so. <laughs> and um, hews him in pieces. I don't, by the way, by, that, about that, I believe it wasn't just turning him into a can of dog food. I believe he dismembered him like a burnt offering as Amalekite, the Amalek was meant to be devoted to God. That's what I really believe happened there. He dismembered him to show Saul this is what you ought to have done. But that chapter before that is inc simply incredible. It's the honey chapter. 
It's when Jonathan decided to, uh, to secret himself away with his armour bearer to go and take on the Philistines' garrison. Remember that story? And he goes up there and he smashes them anyway. At the time, there's a big noise in the camp because Jonathan had started it with the garrison and Saul's like, oh, right, we can go and fight everybody now. And everybody started coming out of the woodwork in the Israelitish army to fight. Before Jonathan had got back, does anybody remember the silly oath that Saul had made? I'm going to make an oath because it's all about me. I don't want anybody to eat anything all day long until I, me, me, has been avenged of my enemies. And everyone goes, oh, okay. It's a bit strange. So they go out and fight all day long. And remember, they come to the wood and the honey dripped. Remember that story? Jonathan sees the honey because everyone's feeling faint. It says they actually feel faint. And Jonathan uh, sticks the end of his spear into the honey and he goes, when his eyes are enlightened straight away, he's like, let's go get some more Philistines. And everyone else is going like, oh, you go, Jonathan, but you're going to be in trouble because your dad said this. And Jonathan couldn't believe it. He said, if only my father had made such a stupid oath, this would have been a great victory now, but look what's happened. And that was in connection with the honey. And there's, there's Saul, so typical. He gets really mad in chapter 14, really, really mad because no one's listening to what I say. And then in chapter 15, he's trying to justify for him not listening to what God said. It's amazing. But there's the sweetness of the honey. Samuel was like that. Samuel was somebody who wouldn't let the word of God fall to the ground, like the honey dropping on the ground. It's it's, it's actually interesting too. Samuel um, came from a place called um, Ramathame. Is it Zophim? It means the hill of the honeycomb. Like, there's just these lovely little correlations. There's Samuel, asked of God, hears him, always listening to his word, and there's the difference in Saul. And so if we take in the sweetness of the honey, brothers and sisters, it will change our life. Just another, another, another nice quote is Psalm 19. Have a look at this one, these ideas. And it's in connection, too, with our eyes being enlightened. Enlightened to righteousness. We can see better when we take the honey in. For the kids, if you want a nice metaphor, a good image, taking in the honey of the word is like having a can of energy drink. Your eyes fire up and you're ready to go and you can see clearly. It says here, the precepts of the Lord are right in verse 8 of Psalm 19. And that they rejoice the heart. See, it's sweet. The commandment of the Lord is, of Yahweh is pure. Enlightening the eyes. Same ideas as Jonathan says. See how my eyes are enlightened now that I've taken of this honey? The fear of Yahweh is clean, enduring forever. The rules of Yahweh are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey. And drippings of the honeycomb. And so we've already looked at it. So we, we want to know this is how... We're going to be part of that war machine in the air, in Revelation 7. We want to be part of it. John wanted to be part of it. God's offered to us this exact same thing. Eat the scroll. Take in the honey. Don't, don't be rebellious like the rebellious house of Israel. They refused. I don't want to eat it. That was Saul. Take it in. Make it change your word. The word of God will sweeten absolutely every single area of our lives your relationships with one another in the truth it'll sweeten that it'll sweeten your family life it'll sweeten your attitude towards work your attitude towards the future the way you look at your brothers and sisters the way you feel towards your ecclesia and your input into that the honey of god's word sweetens everything It gives you a clear perspective about what you should be doing and where you should be going in life. Take away the sweetness. You won't won't feel the bitterness against sin. You won't feel angry anymore. Every time you fail, you'll think it's okay. The world's not such a bad place. Why is everybody going on about it? We need to take in the word of God, which makes less bitter our life in every single aspect. So that we can, as Isaiah 7 says, choose the good and refuse the evil. Now, 
Are there any questions about any of that? I know we went through it quickly. I'd, I wouldn't mind just finishing just in Revelation. I, I did have a summary slide seeing how they went to such great efforts to put this up. There it is. The sweet is love for right and bitterness is hatred for sin. So we know how to refuse the evil and choose the good so that we may enjoy the sweetness of the kingdom and avoid the most bitter product of sin, which is obviously death. And there's, there's tons of quotes about this. But I want you, surely you understand that. We've taken the word of God and we have, a, we have a hatred for sin. We have an aversion to it. Now, I wouldn't mind finishing just briefly with this point out of Revelation, okay? How many symbols of prayer are there in the book of Revelation? And all the symbols of prayer that I can find in Revelation all have got one aspect to them. And it's fitting for our studies and our theme this weekend, the return of Christ. So in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 10 we see that John's on the day of the Lord. Now the day of the Lord, contrary to what you know, Catholics will say, it's the Lord's birthday and so forth. It's not. It's the day of the Lord is the day of judgment. That's what John was looking for. He was actually in his mind, in vision, sitting there on Patmos away from everybody. All he was thinking about was the kingdom. That's what he wanted. Praying for that day. In Revelation 5 verse 8, we've got a picture of the saints or the the uh, 24 elders and the four beasts and they've got bowls and those bowls are full of full of incense full of incense which are the prayers of saints all of them in that vision of the kingdom praying for absolutely one thing like revelation always prays for how long how much longer all the way through the Bible, how much longer is it going to be, Father? We ask the same question every day. Really? Not here yet? How much longer? In Revelation 8, you have this vivid picture of the symbols of the incense going up to God. There was much incense because at this time, right at the time of the trumpet judgments, which was a terrible time for the uh, brothers and sisters to have to watch this system coming to power, they're praying for the kingdom. Praying for vengeance against this system as well. And then Revelation 9, 9 right at the time, I think it's the, um, the sixth trumpet, you have a, a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which, does everybody know the tabernacle structure and all the bits and pieces of the furniture? The golden altar, unlike the altar at the front, which they had the burnt offerings on, the golden altar is right up against the veil. It's the altar of incense which represents prayer. And from that place in Revelation, there are prayers for judgments against you know, this system again, to bring the Turks down against that, uh, the Roman Catholics. Epic struggles in history. Amazing battles, all designed by God to judge this system. In Revelation 15, right at the time of the vials, we've got exactly the same thing. There's four... Our uh, beasts are seen there with their golden um, bowls full of incense. And once more, here it is, on the Roman Catholic system, prayers are made to bring it to an end and bring forth God's kingdom. And I'm sure we all know what that final prayer is, don't we, in Revelation 20? Because the prayers go all the way through, marching through to the end. And I think it's, I think it's absolutely fitting that the Bible finishes with that prayer about in Revelation chapter 22, when John says, Even so, come Lord Jesus.